Hi teammates all around the world. Welcome to this edition of Let's Talk. And that's what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna waste too much of your time. I'm gonna get right in it with my, with my guest tonight. And I hope those of you that are out there, whether you're here for one minute or the whole time we're on, I hope you enjoy and get some quality information from my guests. So I'm gonna pull you up right now, Keith, and then we're gonna get started. There we go, and there's Keith. Let's see. Did not work. There we go. Keith, what's good? Sean, what's good, my man? What's good in the hood, man? Not much, not much, man. Just getting back in. Yeah, I, I, I figured you, 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 you was gonna be walking right in from practice. Yep. That's why I scheduled yep. a little bit later. Yep. Yep. That's perfect. Perfect time. Okay. So we're gonna get right to it. Do me a favor and introduce yourself and tell the people out there what you're doing now, and then we'll get to all the other stuff. Yep, so Keith Thomas uh, from Washington, D.C., currently as the uh, player development structure for uh, Brunswick Leuven. Um, yeah, that's it right now. Okay, so um, let's, I mean, let's go way back, okay? What was your basketball career like before you started doing high-performance training? Yep, so um, I went to college basketball. Uh, I was a Division II player. Um, I went to Bowie State University, then finished out at uh, Goldie Beacom College, um, which is another D2 in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, before then, of course, I, I could have played. Uh, I had offers from Division One, but um, I was a, a what, what you call a smart, lazy student. <laughs> so, uh, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have the qualifications for Division One. So I had to, I had to settle for Division Two. Okay. Now, you and I both know there are hoopers, and I, I tell this to people all the time, there are hoopers in D1, D2, D3, NAI, JUCO. What is, the, what is something that separates a D D2, D3 guy from a D1? Um, it's actually, it's, just, it's the discipline. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main factors is it's less than skill, very more discipline, um, more so academics. Mm -hmm. Um, more than anything that, um, in my perspective, uh, cause I played with a lot of guys that was one vote away from McDonald's all American at the division two level. Yeah. A lot of guys that played division one at a uh, high majors who just messed up, um, and then end up having to go division two. Mm -hmm. Um, so that it all just comes back to being disciplined at the end of the day and, um, how hard and work and dedication you are willing to be off the court. Mm -hmm. Um, the off the court was a, a big factor in a lot of Division two, right. Division three, Division one players for sure. Issues, and the, the crazy thing is that a lot of D two, D three uh, players they hit me up and, and they say, "Hey, can I play overseas?" Um, it's not so much about where you're coming from; it's just whether you can hoop or not. If you can hoop, people are gonna find you. Yep. If, if you know, if, if you can hoop, come on, you know, it's not it's not dependent on you being a D one player. No, nah, for you know? sure. For sure, for sure, and like 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 you said, it's it's you're going to get found. And I had to teach this to a lot of kids back at home in Washington D.C. when um everybody has that Division One dream, and um I had to also let them know that to get reach your ultimate goal, whatever level professionally you may be, it doesn't always have to be a Division One. Yes, Division One mm -hmm. increases the chances, right? Of course, because right. you uh, you you might be getting more televised games, more coaches are coming, more scouts are coming to those. But at the end of the day, if you perform wherever on any level, you can be found. I agree. Um, let's go back to you. And when did you start to think, so you're, you're going to, to D2 school. When did you start to think, okay, maybe the league or maybe going overseas, maybe that's not going to happen for me, but I see my niche in high performance training. What, what, when did you start originally thinking about that? So I'm, a, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the product of a coach's son. So, um, who was, who was very, very, very honest with me. I consider him one of the best coaches ever. Um, so I always, I always knew the reality of things, especially when I stopped growing at five, seven, I was five, seven since I was 11, 12 years old. Uh, once I got to high school and realized that I reached that peak of growth, um, I, uh, skill wise, I wasn't that athletic. Of course, I was a great shooter um more than anything uh 
And um, the reality for me set in probably around my senior year or I'll say freshman year of college mm -hmm. um, when I when I realized uh, my struggles um, at the Division II level. Mm -hmm. um, as much as I used to look, feel like I was above it, um, I could I could have been playing D1, but I got humbled very quick. You know what wow. I'm saying? Going against a lot of uh, upperclassmen who was just who was better um, at that level, mm -hmm. um, and realizing, damn, it's it's Hoopers, it's Hoopers right. here, you know. And um, so and like I said, I, I was raised by an honest coach, so I was able to be honest with myself long term. Um, I studied sports management, and from there, I said, hey, listen. As a freshman, sophomore, I'm like, listen, I, I think I'm gonna become an agent. I think I'm gonna become anything outside of professional basketball player. Right. I, I came to that, I used it. Now at that point, that's when I started to use basketball to reach other goals right. uh, as far as completing, getting the scholarship and, you know, creating a, creating a path to get to wherever as far as a trainer or basketball coach. Mm -hmm. So you're a coach's son. So what qualities do you have that your dad has, or what that you got from your dad. So uh, a lot, a lot of guys right now was tuned in from back home. Um, uh, my dad, my dad, I consider him a mastermind when it comes to basketball. But more than ever, everybody knows my dad was very, very passionate. Mm -hmm. Um, he was, he was. A lot of people would say he was a ticking time bomb, <laughs> but more so me, me having that understanding. He was just very passionate about the game and the growth of the youth. Um, so I think I think one thing I picked from him is results, loving results. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love I love pouring into every individual I come across mm -hmm. on and off the court and getting and getting the results and seeing them succeed. So um, I think that's that's my passion to to help people grow mm -hmm. is my main thing that I can say I got from my pops for sure. That's dope. When did you have how, or how old were you when you had your first paying client and what was it like to, to realize hey this person believes in me enough to put his or her money out there and support what i'm doing and that person believes in me how was that as a feeling so it was a probably i think i was uh 21 years old um uh i had uh I, my college career ended early mm -hmm. due to a back injury mm -hmm. The, um, I got diagnosed with something crazy called radiculopathy, which is a, a spinal condition where um, the muscles get tight around the spine and then it goes all the way down to the foot and the foot goes dead and wow. things like that. So I ended up losing my scholarship. Well, they ended up not renewing my scholarship at, at Division Two level. That's how it works. Um, they didn't renew my scholarship, so I ended my college uh, basketball career a little early than expected. Um, of course, uh, that that brought a lot of downtime and depression for me because I didn't yeah. expect basketball to be eliminated that quick as far as me playing. Yeah. Um, so reality set in. So one of the things my dad, of course, um, he wanted me to get into coaching right away, but I really wasn't <laughs> um, on that path. You know, right, I wasn't right. ready. To, I wasn't ready to you know really get into it that way. But um, he one day he uh, he was like, "Yo, I got Drew Gooden, um, who was at the at the time playing for the Washington Wizards." Yeah um he was like man he wants us to work him out you know come on uh so i i was a part of that workout and um after that workout uh, he was like yo you take control of this boom boom the shooting the mm -hmm. construction and um drew and then i ended up working out with drew gooden for at least about five more sessions and he was my first paying client mm -hmm. so obviously your dad saw something in you that you didn't see it yourself yes at that time for sure for sure mm -hmm. that's dope man that's that's dope um where did you go from there what were the next steps for you for, for me? um man like i said i didn't really i didn't i still didn't get into the basketball side dominantly until i was about 25 years old um before then uh i was uh managing i was managing a club back in dc a big time club so I was on the business, more so on the nightlife business side mm -hmm. of things. Um, and then eventually the club that I was uh, managing was owned by a financial advisor by the name of uh, Rudy Klein Thomas, who also had a lot of NBA clients. Um, he also seen my potential of what I can be on the sports side, but he used that business structure of the club to teach me a lot of things. Um, and then eventually, uh, once I got tired of that, 
and I, I, I grew another, I grew my passion back for basketball. Um, I left the nightlife, and then that's when I uh, joined my dad's program, which is a Nike program in the States uh, by the name of Team Takeover. Okay. Um, arguably uh, considered one of the best, if not the best, mm -hmm. youth program in the whole country, um, which is on the most dominant uh, circuit, which is the Nike circuit, EYBL circuit. Yeah. Um, so around 25, 26 um, is when I got back into basketball, and then that's when I... Um, I started coaching uh, at the. I started co coaching 13U, which is seventh grade back in the states. Right. Um, I was assistant coach with one of my big bros by the name of Raymond Brewer, who was a big time player in um, in the states as well. Who also had a um, uh, a short uh, career ended um, due to injuries. He uh, tore both his ACLs. He was a top ranked top ranked guard in the country um, for a long time. Uh, so he ended up, uh, my dad, but my dad coached him as well. Um, so I went under him for a long time uh, as far as uh, the seventh grade level in the team takeover program coaching. Mm -hmm. um, then from there, that's when I ended up head coaching an eighth grade team, which is the 14U um, at probably around 26, 27. Um, and then from there, it just took off. My best friend was, uh, well, is Victor Oladipo. Yeah. Um, so once he got drafted, things like that, as far as being a part of his uh, business management side, as well as training him as well, mm -hmm. uh, that's when that, that kind of took off for me as well, when mm -hmm. I got more dominant onto, onto the basketball training side as well. What's the, the, the biggest difference between, I mean, you've done both coaching and now also what, what you do with performance um, um, coaching, which is a totally different yep. thing. For sure. What do you think is, is easier for you, the, the, the coach or the high performance coach? Like, um, for goals or really breaking down a player's game? Obviously, you're still doing doing that now, so that's probably the answer. Yeah. But what yeah. do you think um, is, how, how, how did you get into that? Um, I would say, yeah, uh, breaking down a player's game, the player development side is a little bit more easier for me, I would say. Um, as you're only managing one ego, right. one one person. Um, on the <laughs> hey, end, that's not know. always. That's still not always easy. No, it's still not always the easiest. It depends <laughs> on that, that person, you know. Um, but coaching, coaching, uh, coaching has its has it had its pros as well as far as uh, coming easy as far because once again I was a coach's son, so I knew I knew how to manage a lot of egos. I knew how to manage the, the parents. I knew how to do all of those things as far as also getting the best out of my players. Mm -hmm. um, so, but honestly, me being able to primarily focus on one player makes it a lot right. easier than, of course, being right. able to, especially in the States, um, right. when it comes to that as far as coaching. Um, in the States, coaching – can be a little uh, more challenging from what I've experienced than out here um, due to so many teams, so many leagues. The kids are getting so – it's so many trainers. So mm -hmm. as a coach – Bring me to my next question. Yeah, as a coach, as a coach, um, it will be times we will practice three times a week. Um, but then the, those other – Four days out of the week, the kids may be playing with another team or in another league with less structure. Mm -hmm. So now the habits that right. you may have built as a coach um, into these kids are now backtracked right. due to now they're practicing bad habits with right. their league. They're playing. Of course, you'll want them to play more free, but you still want them to play the game the right way. Right. Um, so that was that was one of the most challenging things for sure. And that's why uh, I say. As a as a as a trainer as a uh, skills developer, it's a it's a it's a little more easier than being a coach for sure. So, you kind of brought it up a little bit. There's a lot of skill development players or coaches these days. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm old, but back when I was young, there was there was the park. Right. <laughs> like, right. There was the right. park. There was no skill development coach. It was I'm going with my big brother to the park. And he's going to pick me on his team, even though he's five years older than me. And that's how I'm going to learn, right? Now, I don't see anybody in the parks, but I see him in gyms with guys that may or may not be qualified to, to coach. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody can coach. Um, and how do you feel about the fact that there's a, such a 
been such a rise in skill development trainers um, these days back home, especially where where it may be even getting a bad name. Um, I, I honestly think it can it can come off watered down. Um, uh, because the and because there's for for a player's development, especially when it comes to the youth and I trying to identify themselves as a player, when you're getting so much insight from so many different trainers, it's it's hard for you to figure out who you are. Um, so and then it's a lot and it's a lot of cases where train tra uh, parents back at home um, are a huge, 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 <laughs> huge, 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 huge factor of this because um they try to they try to find the uh the different trainers that would make their kid the next michael jordan right um so they 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 don't have any loyalty or as well um and some of them don't even have the knowledge of the game so it it, it really puts the it detriments the the kids growth right um but how do i feel directly about the trainers back at home i know back in washington dc there's a lot of there is a good good crop there's a good crop but then there's a select few that are, are i feel are doing it for views um and and they'll have a hundred they'll have like 20 10 10 to 15 kids in one workout and i don't feel that's like not, that's very busy that's, that's not, not that's not individual work. That's you know that's, <laughs> that's exactly, no and I um I'm big on reps. You know I'm right. I'm very big on reps. Um, so in that case, when I see kids going to a group session for an hour with seven to ten kids, I feel like, what are you really getting out of this? Right. You know, I mean, you're not you're not really getting. I mean, you're not because you're lacking in reps. You're not building consistency. You're not getting. You're not. You're not building any stamina. You're not. It's just sometimes it's just bad practices. Yeah. Um. So that's one of my biggest things for back in the states right now, as far as all the trainers. Um. It can. It can. It can really create. Uh. It can really dismantle a kid to be able to identify who they really want to be as a basketball player. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um. Uh, now we're gonna go into my pet peeve, and that's AAU ball. Basketball. Okay. I am, I am a big time hater of AAU basketball and everything it represents right now. Um, just because when I was young, I was like that first group crew that started with AAU. Mm -hmm. When it was mm -hmm. really about getting scholarships and, and really like there was, we had Nike as a sponsor, right. Um, right. but we didn't take, we went to California once, we went to Phoenix once, and that was pretty much about it. Yeah, uh, we, uh, yeah, we, had, yeah. we had Vegas as well. I'm from Vegas, and we had Vegas. Okay, Vegas, Vegas, okay. Vegas. Yeah, Vegas had so, the biggest one. Uh huh. So, 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 at that time, there was, there was, um, it wasn't as watered down, maybe. Um, so the competition to get on those teams was fierce, and you only had the the best of the best of your city that were representing your. It wasn't like ten teams from Vegas. It was like right. two, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, and the, the competition was fierce. So if you got on one of those teams, then you were really a pretty high level prospect, let's put it like that. And um, of course I've been gone for a long time, so I don't see everything, I just hear things. Um, but of course now it's a lot of business. It's, it's, it's big business, you know. Um, how do you see the American culture of AAU basketball as opposed to the European system of pretty much the total opposite, at least for now? Um, like so I've only been able to really experience this whole European culture of basketball for almost three months. Of course, I've been coming here every summer for the past seven, seven, seven seven right. years. Um, but as far as now being actually involved, the, the, the difference that I see right now in the AU, as much as I, I like. I like that there are these AU programs that are on the circuits, and then there's some a couple farmer teams as well mm -hmm. that's not necessarily um, sponsored teams mm -hmm. that have great development, mm -hmm. um, but they end up getting overpowered by the sponsor teams in the yeah. area, and then they take the kids, and then it goes from there. Yeah. Um, as far as the AU culture though in the states, um, I think it's beneficial, but it's the the cons is the cons right now to it is uh, there's no loyalty. 
there's a lack of there's a there's a huge lack of loyalty so once because there is so many teams like you said um once the kid doesn't get a certain amount of playing time or once the kids start going through adversity um you have the parents that's shipping them out they're not they're they're, they're not mm -hmm. they're not willing to let their kids go through any downs um no adversity no adversity. They don't want. They don't want. They feel like their kids should be starting. They feel like their kids should never get taken out the game. Mm -hmm. They don't want their kids really being coached. Coached. Um, they mm -hmm. want them to have the nicest coaches. But when they when there's a passionate coach that really is caring about their growth, sometimes they they stray away from mm -hmm. it. Um, but then there is programs that uh aren't benefiting these kids as well because they'll cater to one. You got some that's having daddy daddy ball the wrong way mm -hmm. as far as the 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 son, the son of the coach is you know getting all of the uh, all of the attempts everything is running through them they're not being really taught basketball um so that's that's one of my main things that's a few of my main things when it comes to the AAU culture and the cons of it mm -hmm. um it's cuz it's so many teams right hey it's so many teams and there's so many different leagues right. now that um right. It can it can create fool's gold. It can be fool's gold to these kids and the kid, the coaches and the uh, and the, the the program directors can be feeding these kids a bunch of bull, mm -hmm. telling them uh, they they can get this, they can get that. They don't they don't live up to the promises. They don't they don't help them with recruiting. Um, there it's crazy that there a lot of programs that do have some of these kids that can develop that don't aren't on these uh sponsored uh circuits mm -hmm. they would um just try to just they're just focused on winnings just so they can they, they can get that limelight of being on a circuit right um they're not really um focused on the every player's development mm -hmm. per se um they're not real with the kid and the parents and the family about you know what their who their kid really is mm -hmm. um so you you got a lot of kids that end up losing confidence Mm -hmm. um eventually and then really and then when it's by the time it's too late they realize their basketball careers has ended bef maybe before even high school right. or maybe by their sophomore year of high school because they never really was properly developed and prepared for every level that they were supposed to be going to next um uh, let, i'm sorry let me jump in and ask you a quick question before i forget is high school basketball obsolete nowadays in, in america because of the rise of aau basketball um no not not I wouldn't say that. I think I think high school basketball is pretty dominant still. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as uh that, um, it all depends right now on. It really depends on what level. Um, I know back in Washington D.C. Um, because we have a lot of the top conferences in the country as far as high school basketball. Mm -hmm. Um, that's pretty equal level to AAU, AAU basketball, right. and because we also have a lot of good, solid AAU programs right. within our area, um, I, I would I would say. Um, uh, but I, I wouldn't really say it's it's obsolete at this point, but maybe in certain areas I, I, it could be. You know, er, maybe in certain areas for sure. Um, I know when I talk to some of my guys from the New York area and things like that, um, they have huge issues with it. Um, uh, but... I think I think I think in most cases it's it's not it's not so obsolete. Um, what about what about? Um, oh, there was a question I wanted to ask and now I forgot. Um, oh, it was a good question. Oh, what was it? Maybe it'll come back to me. So in the meantime, for those of you that are just joining, please if you have a question, throw it down in the comment section and I'll try to get it out there. I'll see it. I'll see it pop up and I'll try to get it out there for for my guests. Um, Let's fast forward a little bit in your career. Mm -hmm. so you already mentioned that you've been coming out here to Germany the last seven years or so. That is, of course, associated with your 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 relationship with with Dennis Schroeder. Yep. How did that come about? And um, it's how, how many years is it now? Uh, Eleven. Wow. Okay. Wait. I know a question that I, that I definitely have to ask. Um, just that you're with him 11 you've been with him training with him for, for 11 years we talked a little bit earlier about about um players changing their their coaches right um is it also a challenge to be with one guy or girl or whatever also for a long longer period of time what are the challenges in working with someone for a longer period of time um 
It depends. Whether it be a pro or a college kid or a high school kid, I think it doesn't make a difference. But what are the what are the kind of things that you really have to be aware of when you're working with someone for a longer period of time? Um, honestly, honestly, Sean, it actually kind of does depend on the level. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you got a if you got a young kid and you've been working them out from since they were ten years old mm -hmm. up until twenty one, that's a little different from when you have a pro athlete at eighteen years old all the way up till 30. Um, for, for example, like a pro guy, in a sense, have may have their identity as a player. Mm -hmm. So they, they might, it might be a little bit more difficult because they might, or, or because they might want to add to their game. Mm -hmm. But as far as a youth kid, um, at a young age, if you got them for so long, you can, you can, you can uh, come across, you can build a loyalty with them um in the case of uh and then constantly develop their, their game because now they have the trust in you right. um but when at that pro level there's so many guys um in their ear uh saying i can do this for you i can do that right. for you and, right. and 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 things of that sort um for an example like with me and dennis uh Yes, it's been 11 years of training, but I also at the pro at, when I deal with a pro guy, I don't I don't recommend just me either. Mm -hmm. Um simply That's because I yeah, I have my I have my specialties. Mm -hmm. You know, um and I know there's other trainers that I that I actually take from a little bit that um have other specialties right. as well that will help that will benefit that player to advance their game. Right. Um at the youth level, uh you can you can you and especially when you're when you're a part of that uh, youth foundation, um, you can you can pretty much freelance as far as because you're trying to you're trying to help them identify themselves and find different ways and it helps you as a trainer as well because you're able to be more open you're able to explore more things as far as um, if you're a special if you feel like you're special in shooting coach but now you got a youth player now okay let me let me help him with ball handling so now that can help you grow as an individual right. trainer as well right. you know um but it'll be when it comes to the pro guys they'll come to you and say hey i want to work on this 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 and that yeah. you know um yeah. and then at that point you don't want to put them at a dis not a disadvantage but you don't want to taunt their growth if you're not special at that right. um so you would you should recommend at that pro level hey yeah, we can do this within my specialty. Yeah, we can implement this. But I know another guy that can really sharpen you up with the way his teachings is and things like that. If you want to do specifically on ISO isolation moves, um, how to read defenses, because they may have a setup where they have multiple guys working out within their workout as far as dummy defenders. Right. Um, so it's it's a lot of it's, so when it comes to the pro level, um, I think that's that. The pro and youth level, that's the differences of um, how you can uh, manage them from long term. I've got to say, man, I, I'm really impressed with what you said about, about you know, letting a, a player go somewhere else that's maybe not your specialty. Mm -hmm. I think that takes a, a, an incredible amount of humbleness, but also knowing what you do well yep. and not being afraid to say, hey, I know somebody that could get that in your bag. I'm yeah. good at this, yeah. but yeah. I know somebody else that could get that in your bag, and you should go. I think there's there's definitely not enough of that sharing the wealth and and really, yeah, sharing sharing knowledge. Um, I'm finding that also with what I do. Um, there's there's too many gatekeepers in in the basketball community. Yes, for sure. Um, yes, for sure. Or they want something for that information. Yeah, yeah, and I. Yep. I really tip yep. my hat off to you, my guy, for 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 being someone that that would support the community even if it's not through yeah. you. Like that's yeah. that that's a level of humbleness, man, that you do not see very often in this business. So I, I really want to tip my hat to you. For um, sure, for sure. Going back to Dennis, like this is like eleven his eleventh season. So you've been you've been with him since the very beginning. Yep. So like I told you you um my uh my best friend is uh victor oladipo so my dad um we started a, a pro training camp um to get some rookies uh ready for the draft mm -hmm. um for their draft and their uh nba workouts their rookie rookie workouts to get drafted um so uh we had uh victor oladipo eric green who was um drafted by the denver nuggets 
and Jerry and Grant mm -hmm. um, all in camp. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, my dad had a relationship with Dennis's agent um, at that time um, who said, hey, I want him to be a part of that camp as well. So um, we was, I was, well, that our group was pretty much the first Americans Dennis got associated with right. leading up until the draft. So we had him, he was living in, well, staying in Washington, D.C. for that whole summer leading up to the NBA draft. Mm -hmm. So me and him built a bond from there. Um, my dad was the main, main guy doing the workouts. Right. But uh, once Dennis got drafted and had to do a uh, summer league, he contacted me to come out to Vegas um, to help him because he was going through a shooting slump at one time. Um, I went out there, helped him with his shot, um, where he then he shot, he was shooting almost 50% from three. He was doing real good. Uh, so me and him ever since then just had that bond from there. Um, I'm going to go side track a little bit because you said something that I want to I want to touch on if you're working with a player I guess it doesn't I guess it really does depend on the skill level but let's say a pro you're working with a pro and that pro wants to fix something on his mm -hmm. shot mm -hmm. how long does it take how many shots does that person have to take how long does it take for a person to change or adjust a shot um so my so usually when it comes to um my my style of training, I, I'm big on building muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Um, so that means you gotta I, get up a lot of shots. Exactly, <laughs> because that when them arms yeah. feel like at the end of the workout, yeah. like they about to fall off. Yeah. that's that's and it it ain't gotta be a lot of movement, but yeah. a lot of reps. Yeah. Um, to where you're now mentally, yes, my arms is dead, but I still am consistent with my form. And things of that sort. So I, I usually go about 500 to 600 makes a workout. Mm -hmm. um, and in the term of the, once we find out the form, the form of your shot, the proper form, then it's, it's probably, it usually takes me two weeks, two to three wow. weeks to get that player, two to three weeks to get that player locked in on that. Um, uh, then, it, then, it's, then it's a case of them, them having to stay consistent with it. Right, um, right. Uh, as far as when their season starts, they don't have to necessarily get up that many um, makes. Because mind you, it's makes as right. well. We're not just talking about a shot. We're talking yeah, about yeah. We're the, talking about we're yeah. talking about makes. We're talking about great good reps. Um, and just becoming. And then what I do for my players, I mentally during that first two weeks, I allow them to know their adjustments. Like if they fall short, I may tell them, hey elbow win mm -hmm. if they fall short or if they're the ball is uh rotating. Keep on rolling around rotating mm -hmm. the wrong way i'm telling them flick their wrists i'm telling them spread their fingers and then i i mentally encourage them by saying you know the adjustment mm -hmm. like now i don't have to say anything mm -hmm. you know you know what to fix mm -hmm. you know this you know this and i tell them all great shooters miss but they know why they miss mm -hmm. if you don't know why if that's the difference between most shooters good shooters average shooters and great shooters they don't know why they're missing their shots. Mm -hmm. um, when you're able to say, I'm not going to miss two in a row. Okay, yeah, I'm going to miss, but I, I know the adjustments on my shot. If I miss short, I know why. Mm -hmm. If I miss left or right, which which should not happen, um, it should even. I, I'm big on if you miss back rim, I love back rim misses. Mm -hmm. But if you miss short, we got a, we, we got a problem. Because that, that could be so many things. That could be the lack of our, uh, locking our elbow out. That could be the lack of using our legs. That could be so many things. But if we it miss back rim, that's a touch adjustment. You know, so that could be just tightening my elbow up. That can be just a, a lighter touch on the, the same form, mm -hmm. lighter touch. Um, so I just allow them, I teach them their adjustments on their misses. That way they can be comfortable. If they miss, they're not thinking about, oh, why did I miss that one? It's all right. Let me get that one back. Right. Next one is going in. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. Um, let's go back to Dennis. Um, I got one more question about Dennis. I mentor players, a couple of players, and the the mentorship is is very personal. It becomes at some point it comes becomes very personal. I'm, I'm sitting there eating ice cream versus sitting there chatting and we're eating ice cream, he's eating chicken or something like that. You know, it, it become, we talk about pets, we talk about family life. It's not just about basketball. I, I can imagine that in the 11 years you've been with Dennis that you've also developed a personal relationship as well. You've been there for kids' birthdays, mm -hmm. births of mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, did you think when you first started working with him that it would evolve the way it has? Honestly, yeah. Really? Um, 
And the and the reason why when he when that like that summer league he had me come out for the first time, his fam he had his whole family out here, his mom, brothers, uh friends. Um so I could, I was able to connect with all the family. Mm -hmm. Um because you know they not none of them really spoke spoke the best English things of that sort. So we bonded mm -hmm. way beyond basketball. Right. Um, even, right before we even really got started. So um, he was on, he was in this he was in Washington D.C. So I was, had to be with him every day. I had to come pick him up, drive him around. He wanted to go where wherever he wanted to go. So we developed a, a, a trust and a bond so early that I knew I I, I was very mm -hmm. confident that this will be my guy for for a long period of time and more so not even just my my uh i guess a client i never even looked at him as a client he was always like a, a like a bro like a little bro like a brother to yeah. me that's dope how how often do you get to train with him these days um so before i came out here of course um it was uh just in the summers um these past two years is the first two years that i actually was going during the mm -hmm. season because again, I was with my uh, program, right. AU program, Team Takeover, which um, I was coaching. So when when you you know when you're coaching, not the high school level, but when you're coaching the youth, they go all year round. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they're not committed yeah. to a high school level. Right. So it's from August August to July, three week break, and then it's another tryout come August. Um, so my dedication, my my my. I wasn't able to fully commit to him throughout his season, um, but whenever he would have any type of slump or anything, he was all I was always a phone call away, and I would just go out. But it wasn't as consistent mm -hmm. um, as these past two years, where we had like a monthly uh, situation where I would go out there um, once a month if he had a home stretch over ten days, um, and then we would get some reps up and things like that. Mm -hmm. um... Okay, let's move on to your role here in, in Brown Stripe because there was a, a, a viewer question I want to get to later as well. Um, so now you're here at Basketball Learning Brown Stripe for the first first season. Um, of course, they, they compete in the first league in, in Germany, the BBL. Um, and not many clubs, not many clubs in Germany have a skill development trainer. It usually falls on the assistant coaches, things mm -hmm. like that, but they're not specifically uh there for that they're there for a, a bunch of different things um how did this role with with basketball learning brown strike how did this start and where do you see it going to um so when i when i when dennis first took over ownership of uh this club um, I already I already had an interest of the European basketball style when ever since I um was with him for I believe the Euro basket, I can't remember, I think it was like 2017 or something like that. Um and I was able to really lock in and see the European style of play and I loved it. I love the physicality, I love the the coaching of the X's and O's, I love the demand and the discipline that coaches um wanted from the players. Um, so I oh, I gained a lot of interest over the last seven years to come over mm -hmm. here and um, be a part of uh, the European European culture as far as basketball. So when it came, when it when Dennis, of course, me and him used to always talk about it. He used to always, you sure? Would you come? Would you come live in Germany? He would always ask me, and I'd be like, Nah. I said I like Germany. I said I always told him, man, like Braunschweig has always been like a second home ever since I came. And I was like, man, listen. I, if, if if the opportunity presents itself, I would definitely come to Germany. As much as I love my love my program back at home, Team Takeover, uh, but I always wanted to expand expand my impact, um, and, and and grow my knowledge of the game. Um, so uh, I because a lot of our guys, we of course we had NBA guys come out of our program, but we have a lot of over uh, guys that come internationally and play overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will always hear about some of their success stories and some of their struggles. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of their struggles. So um, I always wanted to be um, a part of that impact to make the game a lot easier for some of those type of guys yeah. um, coming over here. So um, that's so once once the once once he started to develop the club um, gradually. Uh, and like you said, they they've been growing. They've been able to you know financially get stable and things of that sort. Sort. Um, it it became more clear that 
um, this will possibly this will be actually be a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I did not know it was going to be this year. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know I didn't know this was going to be. I didn't know I was going to actually be in Brunswick until uh, what with Louisville until maybe June, July, no July. Like it, I, 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 it wasn't it wasn't in it wasn't in the vision. Yeah. Um, of course, it was it was man. I feel like it was manifested because I I've been saying I wanted to for right. so long, but um it, it it was never a for sure right. thing um until uh me and Dennis had a man he just sat he sat down I was like man I really want you to be a part I think this would be great for you and I think this would be great for my club I think you can help us grow and then um I'm when it comes to him I, I'll do anything for my guys so um when it comes to putting his visions together and mm -hmm. implementing the style he said and it aligned with who I am mm -hmm. as far as how I like to impact people and organizations. Um, cause like I said, my dad grew this, the team takeover organization from ground up. Yeah. Um, we were, we were, we were, weren't really sponsored. We were just a farm team who ended up getting a Nike deal. Um, so me being raised by someone who I seen, it was an aspiration of mine to be a mm -hmm. part of helping another right. organization grow right. as well. Right. So when this opportunity when this opportunity presented itself, it was it was it was set it was set for me. So now that you've seen players from the German national team, you've worked with with Dennis, you've been around around the, the national team as well, um, and now you're starting to work here in Braunschweig with the pros. What do you see as a, a, a big difference between European pros and American pros? The difference for me is um you the 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 it's a confidence difference honestly there's a huge like state pros um because everybody everybody in the states a lot of state pros grow up with a little bit of arrogance right, right. um so they don't they don't once they get to that level they don't lack right. the confidence but I right. I've come across a lot of uh international pros that still struggle with the, who they are as a player because once again um this this coaches over here are very demanding to play their right. style of basketball right um so a lot of players what i'm what i'm coming to realize can get lost can get lost in the sauce over here mm -hmm. um because they're trying to they're they're trying to be who they who they want to be as well as trying to figure out man who the coach wants them to be right um so that's that's I think that's the biggest thing is the, is the confidence levels of state pros and international pros is that is is the confidence level, I've and, and, they're, and they're willing to identify themselves. I've yeah. never thought, thought about it. Actually, it's a good point because especially if you're if you you've got a really dominant coach over here that wants things his way, you become you can you it could be that a younger player becomes a robot of a robot of the system. Robots, yep, of the yep, system, yep, and doesn't turn into the the player that they can become until they go somewhere else sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good point. I never thought about it that way. Um, I've got a, a, a viewer question. CE, CEO blow wrote quite a while ago. I hope he's still here. Um, being on the other side of the world where they say they have the best coaching. What is one thing a coach from here can take away from European coach, coaches? I, I, I'm assuming coaches in America, what they can take away from European coaches. Well, CL Blow is a part of Team Takeover, so ah. one thing, one thing I can tell him is, uh, you're not, you're, you're the program you're in, um, you're not missing out because with Takeover, we we had a, we had a European. I, now that I'm over here, we had a European structure of how we taught mm -hmm. the game of basketball. Mm -hmm. um, just to give a background, we 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 are the number one team to win the Nike championship, uh, the amount of Nike championships. And we've never had a player average 20 points. Mm -hmm. Never. So we were already system based. Um, we were already teaching kids how to play the game the right way. We were defensive oriented. We were very physical. Every co college coach that recruited out of our program says our kids is always ready to come in as freshmen and play mm -hmm. um, just because of the way we teach. Um, but for for other for other programs, um, I think it's. Uh, one of the things that the coaches could take from the European structure is the structure is is the demand of playing the game the right way. Mm -hmm. um, 
creating discipline within the kids and not favoring stardom. Um, Cause that's a big thing back in the States. Once they get a highly recruited kid into their program, now they, they may become disloyal. They may become disloyal to the kids that's already in their program who know how to play the right way. Right. But now the whole, the whole system is structured just around that kid. Right. And just to, just to, just to cater to, uh that kid and just to keep the nike contract or the under armor or the whatever contract to keep coming in um and to keep the kid happy so one thing i would say is basically uh that's one thing i think coaches could take in the states from the euro league they don't care who you are over here i feel like mm -hmm. you won't play their way if it's that this is the system and sometimes it can be taunting to the, right. to, the to the athlete it right. can be Especially taunting it can be, yeah it can be taunting so it's um it's a, it's pros and cons to it, but you got to know how to do it. You know, when you do have that, that kid that is stardom, you still don't show him the favoritism, but you show him how to be that within, within the structure of the system. Right. Um, and that prepares that kid to go to face any type of adversity, whether at the, at, at any level he, he grows yeah. into yeah. rather than him going to college and still being that stardom and then going to the NBA and realizing you ain't that star. Right. But now, and now you've never been able to adjust, and nobody has ever forced you or demanded that out of you. Honestly. Now, when you're at that NBA level or that pro level, mm -hmm. you're, just, you're you're you stay right here because yeah. you don't know how to not be considered that guy because everybody's been kissing your ass for so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, now that you started working with with uh, the Braunschweig Lurven, you worked with. The pros of the pros, the team, you also work with the players that are looking to become pros, like the younger guys. Um, and you also start working with the, the youth teams, one of my teams as well. Um, what, what do you see about European-based or European-born players, what maybe you don't see in American young guys? Um, that's a tough one. I know. I no, I think that's the tough. On it's, that one. One, it's one main <laughs> thing for me. Um, and this is what I love about being out here. Um, the parents aren't in the way. Oh, oh, yeah. Out here, yeah. Here, um, the parents aren't in the way. Um, that's one of the, the biggest <laughs> things. That's one of the biggest things that I value here. Um. When I when I pour into a kid mentally, I don't have to worry about their car ride home. Right. And then and then, and then right. them being stripped of their confidence right. that I just built up on them. Right. Um that's 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 really that's really the biggest thing that I really value over here over the states is um there's so many there's so many uh basketball geniuses in the states. Um mm. let them tell it. Um uh but over here every kid every kid that i've encountered is a sponge mm -hmm. every every athlete even the ones that um have never been told about themselves but they still are sponges they still want to learn whereas um and they're they're uh they they you can build more consistency with a player over here because of like you said, there's not that many clubs with right. player development guys. So for me, it's it's that's what I value the most over here than in the States. What do you think as far as the style of play over here based on the style of play back home? Like, okay, I'm going to do another shameless book plug. But So my book is the same name, different game, right? Because it's it's a totally different game over here than back home. Um, what do you see as, as maybe the advantages of kids growing up here and learning the system here as opposed to back home? Um, I think over here you learn, um, in certain cases, you can be learning to play the basketball game the right way over here sure. on a consistent, on a consistent basis. Um, but back home, you, you're, you're the freedom, the freedoms, mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of organizations allow will allow you to really, 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 really flourish in your identity. Um because uh you can you can gain a lot of confidence in the States right. for sure. Because it, you will have a lot of right. programs with a coach where the coach will let you go ahead and go. They want you to go for 40. Mm -hmm. You know, where in, in here 
um, it's it's more it's it's very more structured based. Um, but I think that's the main difference. Like kids, more kids here learn how to play the right way than back at home. But more skill, more kids back in the states have more skill for mm -hmm. sure than mm -hmm. here because of the way they're the train. Of course, the multiple trainers, the reps they're getting, and um. Things of that sort. Are them skills used? Sometimes the skills don't translate because they're not being taught how right. to use it. Right. But the kids back at home in the states, I feel like, have a, a higher skill level at most of the levels simply because of that, the freedom and the and the gym access, mm -hmm. and the gym access and the trainer access than over here for sure. Right. Um, one thing that I think is a a big drawback to the development of European players is maybe the fact that everything is based on clubs. You have to play in a club. It's not your high school team, it's your club team. Mm -hmm. So that club has a little bit of a hold on your development. It could be that one club has very good coaches um, and another club has really terrible coaches. There's so many different levels. And because of that, it depends on where you're at, how, how how you develop. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a place that has a Bundesliga club like like here in Braunschweig, then you're going to probably have access to better coaches. But if you live somewhere in the countryside, you're not going to have the same access to, to quality coaches. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, problems that face European players, that, that it really depends on where they live, how much access they have to quality For sure. coaches. For sure. And I think we talked about this shortly. And I remember I told you I wanted to meet you on it because that's one of the main things I want to impact, um, not just in uh, in our club, but in the Germany culture, maybe like creating an app or some sort that provides the resources, that provides the teaching, doing training clinics. You know how they have exactly. coaching, yeah. coaching yeah. clinics, doing yeah. training clinics to teach those that may have maybe aspiring to be trainers or coaches. Right. Um, to spread that impact in, in different places. Um, but yeah, that's big over here. That's that's one of the that's one that was a, that was another key factor of why I wanted to come over here and, and, and impact. Um, because I, I see the momentum that Germany is gaining basketball wise. It's um, obvious. Yes, it's, it's very obvious, as you can see in the World Cup and everything in the Olympics. Um, but it can grow. It can grow a little faster if the resources. And, and and was available, right. um, and I think there's a lack of that. Um, but I think it's I think it's pe people out here aspiring, but they just don't know where to start. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why that's one of the reasons why I came out here because I wanted to be a part of um, raising that awareness and raising that that that, that mo momentum for to continue the development of Germany basketball. I appreciate that. That's a dope answer. Um, I've got a couple more questions. Two yeah. more questions. Yeah. Um, can you share one career goal? You're a young guy, so you got you got many, 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 many years of doing what you do. So, but have you? Do you have one career goal that you have not yet reached? Yeah, I'm, I'm finally I'm working with a pro team, so I checked okay. that off. Okay. But my my ending my uh, not my ending, but one of my career goals was. Because I never wanted to coach, never wanted to coach or anything in the NBA. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be a part of player development or anything in the NBA, but I always wanted to be a GM, an NBA, assistant GM or somewhere in the front office okay. of an NBA team. Okay. All right. That, that's, that's, that's the next step. I'll be following your progress on that. I got you. Um, last question in two parts. If you're speaking to a young European player, what advice would you give knowing what you know about American basketball and also vice versa. If you're talking to a, a young American kid, what advice would you give that player about European basketball? Um, well, to start with the American basketball players about about the European game, mm -hmm. um, it's hoopers. Like mm -hmm. the reality is it's hoopers, it's hoopers internationally. Um, for a lot, I know a lot of my guys in the in the states. They all they only think about NBA, 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 and they don't they don't expand their minds to know that there's a career internationally, mm -hmm. um, and they'll they'll look at it as a downgrade. Right, right, right. And, and I, hey, hey, that's why I, that's where I come in. That's my that's my point where where I get to players and I'm like, yo, there's hoopers all over the world. There's basketball overseas. 
There you can make money okay. overseas. Yeah. And they really do think that it's a downgrade if if they don't make the league and they don't realize there's a, a wealth of basketball overseas as well. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. So that's that's my biggest thing to American Hoopers like you you can make a career over here. You can change you can you can change your life. Your life. You can you can yeah. really change your family's yeah. life still yeah. by yeah. playing internationally. Um as far as for European basketball players mm -hmm. Um, my, my, my advice to them is because I see how I, I've been with, I've witnessed how, because it's so many limited clubs, mm -hmm. the window of opportunity is, is it, it can seem so small. Um, my thing is don't allow, don't allow the club or coaches to tell you or to make you believe you can't you can't succeed to that next level mm -hmm. um i think because because there is a small window because it's so limited here um a lot of players that i've even encountered they put so much pressure on themselves to be able to make it to from a regal to a bbl or from a jbbl to a regal team mm -hmm. um i man just have fun with the game still have fun, like still have fun with the game. Don't put, cause it, it's a uh, over here. It's a business. It's more of a business earlier, mm -hmm. you know. So it it, it could take the fun out the game for a lot of kids because they're they're putting so much pressure on themselves to get to that next. Cause it, it can end, you know. Um, so I would tell them continue to enjoy this game, mm -hmm. continue to enjoy this game every second of it, even through the ups and the downs. Enjoy this game so you can continue to. That's if you put all this pressure on yourself, you can hurt yourself. Right. You know, and don't let no club or coach do that to you. Because at the end of the day, you all have started this this game of basketball because you you liked it. It was fun to you, or you love or you love it. You don't let you don't let anybody or any anything strip strip what you love from yeah. you. Um. So that's that would be my biggest thing to European players because, like you like I seen even a lot of people in the comments. Should I listen to my coach, European coach, and things like that? Listen, man, enjoy it. If your coach is giving you a hard time, it's still embrace it. Like, because at the end of the day, life can be so much harder. Yeah. If one of the toughest things in your life is a coach giving you a hard time, <laughs> you got a pretty damn good life. Yeah. Enjoy, enjoy your, enjoy, enjoy playing basketball as long as you can, for sure. I want to get, sorry, I want to get two uh, viewer questions in there because I just saw them. Um, one from Timothy, who also wrote something before. How do I train individually in winter with almost no open gyms? That's I'm assuming Timothy is is in Europe. I'm assuming, and that's a big problem if you're not Ooh. with a club. Mm -hmm. That's a huge problem. Um, and, and honestly, my advice with that one, um, and I, I'm not sure. Maybe you can help me with this. I'm not sure if there is certain public public uh, facilities. No. no, that's the problem. That's the problem. There's no YMCA. There's no boys club. There's no rec leagues. There's nothing like that out here. So that's what I said earlier. If you're not associated with a club, um, and 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 really so, able to climb the ladder of that, we got club, it. So now, Sean, we gotta oh, go. We, we gotta. We gotta. We go, no, we go. We, no, we gotta. No, this, we worry. gotta. We gotta go throw. We gotta go throw back to the states. We we gotta go to the park. Yeah, it, it, exactly. We gotta exactly. go. We gotta. Exactly. I know. I know. I know the the weather out here in Germany. It, it gets below zero and everything, but we gotta put our we gotta put our gloves on. We gotta put our gloves on. We gotta put our gloves on and we gotta we gotta get on YouTube. We gotta get yeah. on YouTube. We gotta yeah. find some 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 prominent trainers who are posting some good videos that we think can help us. We gotta pick pick about three videos. Three videos and uh, I say about three videos a month mm -hmm. and then just work on those drills. Perfect those drills. And then the main thing I would say when you're looking, because one thing that you can be a player that's trying to train yourself and be doing it the wrong way. So you got to pay attention to details, really pay attention to the footwork of the drill, really pay attention to how hard the player is going, really pay attention to how, how they're pounding the dribbles, really pay attention to the pace of the player or how the trainer is, you know, and then, and then just try to build consistency on that. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough to train yourself, but it's possible. It's possible. It's yeah. possible. It it's possible. possible. So, um, like I remember, I was over, over, or when it was quarantine during COVID, mm -hmm. I seen this Chinese woman 
and she 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 didn't she didn't like she didn't know basketball at all, but she was stuck in the house for for that for that whole period of quarantine, and she learned how. I mean, she started dribbling her ass off by the end of quarantine. Mm-hmm. And like she showed like her videos of how she started and everything. So it's just really just having right. that determination right. and you got to be disciplined. Yeah. You got to you got to if you really want it, you can go get it. You you know what I'm saying? So and you, you just got to you just got to be consistent yeah. with it. That's at the end of the day. And the last one I'm going to take is uh, from Aaron Hildebrand. He said, what's your both of your opinions about sports psychologists? Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mental health advocate. Mm-hmm. Um, my biggest, my biggest, uh, my biggest one of outside of you know shooting instructions and things of that sort. My workouts consist of mental tough, mental toughness building, and I don't even know if I want to use the word mental toughness because I don't, I don't. A lot of people may consider themselves mentally weak and things of that sort, but it's times when everyone's down on themselves. So I don't really consider that mentally weak as well because I mean we all have those we times all. in our life. Yeah. You know, so um, but I'm big on building mental character, I would say. Um, so when it comes to sports psychologists, I think it's good. I think it's good. I think it's good yeah, for it's athletes. Good. Um, uh, simply because uh, basketball, basketball is probably around 30 percent skill, 70 percent mental because you got to know how to apply it. Yeah. You got to you got to be willing to understand the game and things of that sort. Once you got the skill, it now becomes on how do you think the game to uh, mm-hmm. implement everything. So, yeah. um, I think sports psychologists can help slow the mind down and allow you to uh, implement everything that you learn skill wise and things of that sort. So, yeah. as far as coaches and dealing with coaches as well. Um, so yeah, I think I think I think that's 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 a big that's a big part. I have teamed up with um, someone who is actually a, a current player. She plays in Spain, and we're doing something together as far as the, the mental side and, and mentoring athletes and things like that. And, and it's amazing what we talked about and the ideas we've tossed, tossed around with each other because she, of course, has the clinical part that she went to school with. She's got her master's and stuff like that. And I've got that, that player side. Okay, I know what you're going mm-hmm. through. You know, mm-hmm. but if it becomes more, or if it needs to be really detailed, then 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 I put them on her, and she shout out Sam, um, and um, and I put push them on her. That they, they not push. I advise them to to work with her, and then they're able to to work deeper into things, and it could be things that are, have nothing to do with basketball, that's affecting your your basketball, right? Um, so I think that's a really important part. It's the next step in 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 just like. Teams are going to start now looking into skill development players like or coaches like yourself. They're going to also look for the mental side at some point. Right. That's the next step right. in 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 the the, the thing is of, of basketball how how would it how would it go on to optimize athletes? Yep. that'll be the next I step. I think that's I think that's where basketball is, is on the way to um being more of a mental case, a mental mental situation um for coaches and everything to consider because right now all basketball athletes are becoming more skilled at an earlier age. Right, right. So so now now it's it's not going to be a case of teaching this kid how to dribble or it's going to be really teaching them the mental aspect of the game more than anything at an earlier at, at earlier right. ages. Um and that's scary. so I think like that's like, scary. You know, you know really really so and then now it's going to be t- teaching them how to maintain their egos, how to maintain um, you th- now that you're so skilled early, you think you may know it all. You think you may, so it's really, it's really, it's really developing into more of a mental game than anything. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, my guy, I'm gonna get you out of here because I went far over the ex- the expected time that I promised you. <laughs> We're now like an hour, a little over an hour in. I, I, I think I told you 45 no minutes. Problem. But I, I, no I'm problem. Vibe, reviving, dog. So, yeah, for sure, so, for sure, I, I for sure. You coming on, my my man. Um, I've got one last thing. I have a tradition with this show that um, my current guest recommends a future guest. It can be anyone in basketball. It doesn't have it doesn't have to be a player. It can be a GM. It can be an agent. But somebody you think might have valuable information that might help help any players out there for their future. It can be anybody. So the key is you also have to help me get that person. Okay. So, not okay. only are you nominating, but you will also hit this person up and say, hey, I think you need to talk to this guy. 
Who you got? I'm gonna go with two. I'm even go. I'm gonna go with my pops, and or I'm gonna go with Eric Green. Let's do it. We'll talk about it later. I definitely want to have your pops on and, and get that 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 passionate thing. I, I I'm a passionate dude too. So yeah. I, I'm I'm for sure gonna vibe with your yeah. pops. So I definitely want to do that. And then we'll talk. We'll talk and, and uh, get get. What do you say? What do you say? His name? Eric Green. Yep. Eric Green. He got, Green. Yep. You got a good story. Yeah, for sure. Okay. He's a he's a. Uh, he led he led college basketball in scoring when he was at Virginia Tech. He's played overseas. He's been he's he's went through all types of ups and downs as he's played Euro League for Fenerbahce and things of that sort. So, for okay. sure, I'm with it. I'm with it, my guy. I appreciate you for for taking the time out and and really. Um, give us some really good in-depth answers to to my questions, and I, I'm sure that this will definitely help um, someone out there. You know, and that's that's the most important thing For to sure. me with this with this kind, sure. of, kind of thing. And um, I appreciate you taking the time out, man. And we we are definitely going to sit together, and we're definitely going to toss some yep. ideas yep. around. We're, it's crazy. We're living in the same city. Don't see each other because you're always man. busy, and I'm always busy. like I like I gotta I gotta pack my bags because I headed out to Turkey in the morning, seven a.m. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but, you know, we're going we gonna to get it done. We're going to find a time. We're going to get it done. And uh, some good things are going to come out of that as well, I'm sure. So, like like I said again, man, I appreciate you taking the time out and um, get on up out of here and enjoy your night. Got, pack up. I and appreciate then, you for get a w, get a w out there yes, sir. Yes. on that next yes, sir. All right. My guy. Later, man. So, everybody, another great episode. We actually went way longer than than I normally do, um, but I, I felt the information that he was giving was was more important than checking the clock. Um, um, I appreciate those of you that are still watching, and I hope some new viewers came around and would like to see more of the guests that I have in line. Yeah, if you were here for one minute or the whole hour and seven minutes, <laughs> I appreciate you, and hopefully I see you again next time. Old head out.